want to say thank you to HBO, the presenting sponsor of NYFF Talks, uh, without whom we could not uh, organize these free admission events that allow us to delve deeper into the films in the lineup and the careers and working practices of the brilliant artists who we are able to bring together uh, every year for the festival. Uh, which brings me to the talk at hand. Uh, when my co-programmer, uh, Devika Girish, and I work on the talks program each year, one of our favorite recurring threads in the program is a series of conversations that we uh, organize called Crosscuts, of which today's is one, uh, which involve bringing together two filmmakers or other artists from across the festival lineup and really um, inviting them to enter into a dialogue about resonances, common threads uh, that we feel, the programmers feel, um, unite their works in some way, uh, that in a way to foster uh, uh, surprising connections between the films. And so uh, today's talk is one that uh, we're really excited about. Uh, the filmmakers who I will announce in just a moment uh, come from our the current section of the festival on the one hand, which uh, is designed to cast an eye on sort of the vanguard of the medium and new forms and voices that are um, sort of pushing forward the, the art form at this moment. And from the revivals section of the festival, which is designed to cast a light on older films that have come back in, a, in the form of a new restoration or a, a new, uh, new form of availability that uh, we want to put into conversation with the new films that comprise the rest of the festival lineup. Uh, and so I think that uh, it's an especially exciting opportunity to draw out the connections across the sections of the festivals in the crosscut. Uh, series of talks. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring up the filmmakers uh, who are joining us this evening. Uh, first of all, the director of uh, Household Saints from 1993 and uh, the short film Renata from 1982, both of which are screening in the revival section uh, on October 7th and October 11th. They're screening as a double bill with the short preceding the feature. Uh, and we're so thrilled to have director Nancy Savoka joining us. And from the current section, uh, with her first feature, after uh, presenting shorts in the festival in prior years, uh, we're so excited to have with us Joanna Arno, the director of... <laughs> and I should have specified her, Joanna's film, The Feeling That the Time for Doing Something Has Passed, will be screening on October 5th and October 7th, so don't miss either film. <clears throat> so, I am so excited to have the two of you in conversation. Um, I'm such a, a huge fan of both films, and I have, uh, I think, um, personal, maybe idiosyncratic reasons for feeling a connection between these two films that we can get into in a, in a minute. Um, but first, since the films haven't officially screened in the festival yet. I was hoping that for the benefit of the audience, you could each just say a few words, sort of setting the stage, telling us a bit about uh, the features that you're showing in the festival so that we can use that as a jumping off point to discussing uh, your careers more broadly and your, your, um, your work, your methods. And so, uh, Nancy, if we start with you, uh, and we also have a clip from each film that we'll show just to give you a taste of, uh, of the film. Sure. Um, this movie that's at the playing at the festival is called Household Saints. It's based on a novel by Francine Prose. Uh, the film came out in 1993, went missing for a while, and we're so happy it's been restored and it's back. Um, and the story basically starts off with a guy who wins his wife in a card game, and they end up having a daughter that is quite surprising. That's uh, so I think uh, we'll go ahead and watch a clip from Household Saints and then hop over to uh, Joanne's film. Thank you very much. Say hello to your husband, huh? Two pounds of sausage. Hello. 
hot or sweet? Mixed. Two pounds of sausage for a rat like you? Not just me. That's too bad. You could use a little extra meat. <laughs> Spare me the beauty advice and give me the sausage. Lino's hungry. Here's some prize, you know that? Ah, it's a couple ounces, so the dollar thing. I saw that. Weigh it again. Well, you saw what? That thumb. Weigh it again without the thumb. This thumb? You know what I can do with this thumb? No. Now do you understand? No. even my mistake. Hey, go ask Lino. Go ask your father where Joseph Santangelo can put his thumb. Oh, boy. Oh, you just wait. That's a scene from the very beginning of the film uh, that uh, and, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio's character is uh, Joseph Sinti. The guy who won her in a card game. That's right. So this is sort of just the, the very early yeah. moment in their uh, relationship. Uh, and then, uh, Joanna, would you say a few words about the feeling that the time for doing something has passed? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, the film is a dark comedy that follows a few years in the life of the protagonist, Anne, as time goes by in her long-term casual BDSM relationship, and then her shitty job and her uh, quarrelsome Jewish family. So it kind of pings back and forth between these two threads, three threads and uh, some other ones. And uh, yeah, uh, I'll let you watch the the clip. It, it's uh, one of the family scenes. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. The union makes us strong. It is we who plow the prairies, build the cities where they trade, dug the mines and built the workshops. Endless miles of railroad lay. Now we stand outcast and hungry mid the wonders we have made. But the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. The union makes us strong. So I, uh, I want to kick things off just to provide a little bit of curatorial context, I guess, in that I um, realized, I realized literally today as I was revisiting the films in preparation for this conversation um, that one way that I might interpret my own um, sense of an affinity between these two films is that um, my own mother was raised Catholic in the, as a teenager in the 60s and 70s, which uh, is a context that is very uh, relevant in Household Saints. It's a real, um, the film spans generations and uh, in this family of Italian-American immigrants uh, that have uh, across the generations very different relationships to their uh, Catholic faith, immigrant culture, um, and um, I, th at the same time, am like Anne, the protagonist of Joanna's film, a uh, early 30s 
professional woman living in Brooklyn, navigating, um, you know, relationships and sex and work. And so I think these films spoke to me in the sense that reminded me of a conversation that I might have with my own mother about the worlds into which we came into adulthood and the contexts that we sort of draw our senses of reality from. And um, so just to, just to lay that groundwork, I think uh, it's a, there's a very personal resonance for both of these films for me. Um, and so I, just to kick things off, uh, I wanna ask you both about where these films came from. In a sense, they are both, if not autofiction, then quite personal, I think, in their genesis. And in a sense, there are also kinds of works of adaptation, um, in whether in a, a literal sense, in the case of Household Saints, or in a, in a slightly less conventional sense um, with the feeling. And so um, I guess, could you, Nancy, start us off by talking about what in uh, Francine Prose's novel you responded to, and what of your own experience uh, inspired you to take that novel and translate it to film? Uh, I was in college, I was in film school when I read the novel, and um, I was just, I was blown away by it because it felt like my biography. <laughs> like someone had written my biography at 20 something years old. Um, and I wrote Francine um, a love letter saying how much I love the novel and that I was in film, it was like so nerdy. <laughs> like, I, I love your novel so much and I'm in film school right now, but one day I wanna make a movie of it. And you know, she said she got the letter and was like, Okay, that's very nice, you know. Um, but what, 10, 10 years later, um, I did. Um, and, and it spoke to me because it's, it's weird. I'm half Italian and I'm half Argentinian. It spoke to the Latin side of me because my mother was one of those people who saw things and she raised me to see things. So the, everything that Lily goes through, I'm, I'm not so much the Tracy Ullman character, but I'm like the Lily Taylor character, and probably the grand, I'm headed for the grandmother right now, so um, yeah, yeah. And Joanna, you're, many of your films historically have been working in this auto-fictional mold, um, and this film in particular, I believe, uh, was born out of a, a project that arose during the pandemic that was uh, a graphic, so why don't you describe uh, sort of the, the genesis? It actually was before the pandemic and then I, um, I was interested in experimenting with um, concise uh, forms of humor and so I wanted to push that as far as I could and started writing these sort of two, three line scenes that drew on personal experience. And then what Maddie's referring to is that then I kind of, in the pandemic, realized that those might be interesting uh, to render as comics too, as one pa single panel co comic. So the film inspired some comic exercises later. And are those comics still on your Instagram, can I tell people to, no? Sure, no. yeah. <laughs> this was, <laughs> I, I encountered these during the pandemic on Joanna's Instagram and was just absolutely uh, obsessed. They're hilarious, so seek out, seek out these comics. Uh, even before you see the film, I could say, um, just to get a taste of, of what you have in store. Um, I guess, uh, building on that, what was the creative process like of taking first these, these written concepts, transforming them into a graphic, and then adapting those graphics into film, which I think ultimately informs the, the form that the film takes. Right. Yeah, although the comics were different than the film, and right. yeah. I, right, not a literal adaptation in oh, any okay. sense. Um, I mean, the writing process was uh, like, I guess it was interesting in that I wrote as many of those as I could and then without structuring them as in the first pass and then I went back and you know tried to create a what I wanted to be a non-traditional structure. I feel like in traditional films there's um I don't know, the change happens so quickly like you start out at point A and then by the end the character goes through a tidy arc and arrives at point B. And you know, I, I just kind of, I, I don't experience 
life like that. So I was curious uh, to kind of take this jumble of scenes that drew on my experience and shake them up and kind of create some, I don't know, uh, some sense of variation in how we kind of experience uh, ourselves. <laughs> And I, uh, both films are in incredibly funny in a, in a register that is um, often very dry. In, a, um, in different, different versions of deadpan humor, uh, I think, run through both films. And I uh, am curious if you could just speak sort of broadly about, um, well, Nancy, first, your, your approach to pulling out these sort of comedic threads of, in a story that is not, strictly speaking, a comedy, but that is very attuned to uh, the sort of cringe, awkward dynamic that can exist in an interpersonal relationship, whether that be familial or romantic. or um, And that, I, I think, you uh, evoke in a way that's ex like very specifically cinematic. Um. I, I just have to say one thing before before I even get into that is that I think you did such a great pairing with us. It, good matchmaking, thank you. Because I found I found you know here I am. I'm old enough to be your mom, you know. But I found myself like you transported me <laughs> to that time, and I relived being that person. And the moments that we still and then you realize you still have them. It doesn't matter. Like you could be 90 and still have those moments. So I really um, just appreciate um, how how your film focuses on the in-between the big moments and the, kind of where the truth is. So I just, I have to say that because it's kind of, and then I, I wanna back up and talk a little bit about the humor because I think it's similar but a little different. Um, the thing that may, might be similar is that we didn't play for jokes. Like there, there was stuff in there that um, I think the cast and I just really made sure that we were being honest to every moment and that's kind of like real life, like things will happen that will crack you up, but it's, it's not that the people involved are like thinking, ha ha, joke. It's like this stuff is happening and suddenly, you know, life is throwing you this weird stuff that is unexpected and maybe the humor comes from the surprises that we constantly get or us trying or something. I mean, I was just watching this scene again, of course, as we all just were, and um, I just love it. I mean, I think the you're watching and it's uncomfortable, you know, because you're not sure, like, he's, like, harassing her, and, like, very clearly, but then the way she responds is what makes me laugh. Mm -hmm. It's just so deadpan, so, like, you know, uh, sure of herself and, like, just the the richness of the imagery. I mean, the food throughout your movie is so um, evocative. And have food at the end of your movie, which uh, cracked me up too. Like, but I think, yeah, I think there's, there's these things of, like these characters, I'm just looking at the similarities between us, mm -hmm. is that um, these women get put in these situations that look like it's gonna be not good, you know? And then somehow, they're just so focused on the reality of what's happening and not so much like the undertone is that I, they're focused on themselves, I think is the thing, and not so much on, they're focused on the process of living, I think. I think that's similar. I don't know, because I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for your character, I don't know. Well, I would say that maybe the difference is my Mm, the character that I play is seeking these out, um, not as opposed to getting put in. Right. But, um, but yes, yeah, I think the, f the focus on, on living and, and, you know, the different threads in, in both of ours, I think, are a similarity. And I'm so thrilled to be on this with you as well. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. I think one thing that you've just kind of both touched on and, or hinted at in a way, um, particularly looking at the comparison between Anne's character and Catherine's character, played by Tracy Ullman, I see them both as sort of wary of the, their environment, in a sense, or, or uh, uh, putting up some degree of sort of skeptical resistance, almost, to what they're experiencing and what they're observing. And, 
And so much of the comedy in both characters seems to come from that sort of almost, almost like sort of a Bartleby the Scrivener, just like reluctance to take at what is what they're encountering at face value, sort of, and and just not necessarily um, uh, uh, trying to smooth over frictional moments of tension or awkwardness or. Uh, and sort of a fraught, unspoken dynamic. And is that, do, do you think that that's uh, accurate? Do you think that that, is that sort of I part of the I think she brought up the point, doing? though, that, that Anne does seek things out, which to me is so interesting and so fearless for someone that appears to be fearful at some, like your first reaction is that she's someone who's very guarded and fearful. And yet, when you see what she's doing, it's like, whoa, like this girl is not afraid. Like she's just walking into these situations. She's, not only is she walking into situations, I think she's setting them up. She's very, she's controlling all these things and yet seems to not be controlling anything, which I think is interesting. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there's like so many portrayals of like the BDSM community and, and that is uh, not accurate and I, you know, was, wanted to be very careful in making this film to show Anne as an active participant in, in her uh, activities that she's doing and, and, um, and show her as you know, someone who's planning um, the sessions as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate it in your film. And again, even the clip just here is just like, I don't know, there's so many layers to this character. Like in some ways, like she's like going with the flow, but, and then another, she's like, you tip the scale, like, yeah. you better right. not charge me extra 10 cents, and, you know. She's on to him. I feel like <laughs> yeah. often, like, characters get flattened, and often, like, yeah. both things are true, which I really saw throughout yours. The, and the thing that I think is attractive to me about these characters, all of them, and um, that is attractive to me about actresses that I love working with, is that it's, no one is playing to the gaze of anybody. It really is, and I go back to like this thing about, I don't know if it's so much about yourself, but it's just some like pure experience thing that's happening that's different from, okay, so this person, not, not that we don't all have those moments and not that all these characters don't have some of those moments, but in general, like in the time you least expected, they're gonna like not do that thing you, you think they're gonna do. Like when the lights suddenly get bright. <laughs> What just happened? I'm uh, so another way in which I think um, you can sort of map out a relationship between your films is in the approach to um, depicting how women want and how women desire and. Uh, there's sort of a, an erotic side to that, whether it be in uh, Anne's BDSM pursuits or uh, in uh, um, Teresa, Lily Taylor's character's uh, sort of fervent faith that almost takes on sort of an erotic quality, uh, uh, whereas at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, uh, the way in which sex is depicted in your film, Joanna, is almost de-eroticized. It's almost sort of, um, and that's another source of comedy, is the way in which sort of the mechanics of these sexual encounters are stripped of what's making them erotic in an external sense. And we're uh, invited to sort of enter into the experience of the characters who are having an erotic experience. And it's sort of, there's that tension between what we see and what we know is underlying these encounters and then with uh, the character of Catherine the film begins and she's she's sort of wary and and you know as we saw in the scene uh, in the clip that we watched she's not taking the bait that this guy is you know the, the sort of um, um, crude jokes that that her husband to be is is sort of offering up to her and she's just not convinced by it and not engaging with it. Uh, and then, of course, as the film goes on and they do get married and, and build a, a relationship and a life together, you kind of see her have a, a 
sort of a coming into her own sexually and, and um, just as a person. And so I'm curious, both of you, uh, how you approach these questions of, of charting out the desires and the pursuits of these specifically women characters um, in, within the sort of cultural context where they exist and how you uh, conceived of those dynamics. It's a big question. Take it wherever you want. Um, if I can remember, this was 30 years ago, so if I can remember. Um, there, at some point, I started actually making charts for characters um, in preparation for shooting and s to talk to the actors and depending if they wanted um, the information, I'd give it to them in that form or for some from some actors that doesn't really appeal to them, so I don't share with them. But for myself, because you know you shoot out of order, so um, if, some, if something's happening here and then tomorrow I'm going back to like the earlier part of their development, I need to, I, I, I actually like check on that in the morning to see how many scenes I'm doing and if I'm all over the map and I try to see if we can shoot so that there's some kind of harmony in how we're shooting so I'm not throwing the actor all over the place. Um, but I think um, in terms of just Tracy, uh, for me, like, again, I had a novel to work with, right? So it, it had its own uh, thing. But, but it's almost like the novel's there, it's like a map, and then the script is there, and it's another map, and then I have to go on the journey, right? So, like, I had to figure, we have to figure out together with the cast, um, like, what makes her change her mind? And if I look at it now, looking back, and and what we went for is there's a dinner scene at some point, if you see the movie, there's a dinner scene where he becomes her ally. And I think that, and then after that comes the hotness. <laughs> but, but during the dinner scene, first she's just got an ally in this world where she had no ally. So that was kind of, you know, her thing. Meanwhile, Lily has no ally except for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus is her ally. Yeah, I was just gonna say, like, I, I liked how in, in your film you don't really see a clear view necessarily of the motivations. You're kind of like peering around corners and like like before he becomes her ally, like you see her like trying a little harder than you would expect at yeah. that, making that dinner for this guy. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I don't know, I so, feel like. So you're right, there might be a yeah, it's, 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 beginning, yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 It's, uh, I just feel like it's a very like these hints that like, yeah. you know. It's not straight out. You're, you're really thinking about what they might be going through, and I like and that. it's not in the writing of the dialogue. Mm. I think well, that's one, one other thing we have in common, is that it's, none of this is in the writing of the dialogue. Like, the dialogue's not telling us, here's where I'm headed. Here's where I'm headed, I'm announcing where I'm headed. It's like you really have to work to, to see these people cha changing, because it's like subtle. Yeah. Um, and mine, I mean, I was just very, much interested in kind of showing a character wrestling with, you know, self, sexuality, relationships, and kind of exploring in, in various ways and in structuring them. Um, you know, it focuses on uh, one of her um, main BDSM partners uh, in the first section, and then, you know, we all have like sometimes re relationships in response to our previous relationships, so it kind of goes a little bit on a journey and maybe there's a return to a previous relationship at one point. I don't want to give away too much, but like, you know, I feel like things don't go in a straight line and I was trying to, you know, structure it along those lines. I'm curious um, how you think through the, uh, the task of playing a version of yourself when it comes to specifically, you know, what Nancy was saying, this sort of um, communicating and emotional states without necessarily writing them into the dialogue, but that are very much born out of your own experience. Uh, was that something that you and you found yourself discussing with your other castmates? That uh, was it was, became an interpersonal dynamic, or was this more sort of uh, just pr presenting a version of yourself, kind of? Um, in, in not opposition to, but in tension with the actors around you? I mean, acting wise, uh, I like to see the dynamics that arise with the people that I'm working with. That's 
you know, a big part of it and uh, had an extensive preparation process with a, a friend who was my acting coach. Uh, and, you know, we'd studied with the same person. So it was just like a lot of, it's a fictionalized version of myself, so more uh, working on what's right for the scene and um, the situation. I'm, uh, just to, to sort of pivot a little bit, I want to highlight the fact that you're both New York filmmakers um, in sort of a, a committed way, it seems to me, um, and, and working in this very um, sort of um, um, f fiercely independent in many senses mode in terms of uh, going against the grain of of um, what might be, um, you know, commercially expected, conventionally sort of uh, uh, um, imposed. So I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about both um, whether, you know, how you identify as New York filmmakers, if you do, and, and your relationship to the city as a setting, as a source of inspiration, um, and also as a professional context, as a, as a place to do this work. Um, I think, f for me, the, the, when people say, oh, like, how do we define independent film, you know, some people think it's just automatically, it's like low budget, you had no money to work with. And that's certainly a part of it. <laughs> um, but, it but I think, the, for me, the thing that announces independent film, I, I don't care where it's coming from or who it's coming from, is that there's a voice there, that someone's telling you a story, as opposed to a movie that's entertaining you, um, that you're kind of consuming, and not to, I watch those films too. I, I love watching those films too. But I always, my ears like perk up when I hear, oh, someone's telling me, there's somebody behind this, telling me this, uh, leading me through. And without exception, I find that th that, that kind of film that has that voice behind it um, will always like surprise me in a way that that's exciting and scary. And I don't know what's gonna happen next. And it kind of reminds me of not that I'm a jazz like person who knows exactly everything about jazz, but what I love about jazz is that you think they're gonna hit one key and then they hit another, and that, that's really exciting to me. So th that, those stories are those things that appeal to me and, and appeals to me when I see it from other people. Um, just it makes me sit up a little, I start, I lean in. Um, yeah, I feel like New York is a big part of uh, the film, um, I wanted to show kind of a mosaic style story that in addition to lots of different kinds of relationships and people, I wanted to show different neighborhoods and environments. So like a, one of the uh, rendezvous is with kind of a, someone in a high rise uh, Williamsburg apartment was very like newly renovated, it says a lot about their character. And then, you know, another one is um, more like a, a dark music studio in Maspeth. Um, so, you know, just like wanting to see different si sides of the city and, and I don't know, I feel like I've lived here my whole life pretty much and, uh, you know, getting to be like, okay, we'll, we'll shoot this at the Smith 9th Street station <laughs> because that's where, you know, you get a nice breeze and like you can see the skyline and maybe we'll only see one little shot of it, but I feel like that will give the scene something. So getting to, you know, use things like that was nice. Both your films are so textural, like they're so like texturally specific to like a milieu, a time, a place, uh, whether that's a period setting as in the case of Household Saints or in like an extremely sort of immediate contemporary uh, mood, I get, you know, like, uh, 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 it feels very immediate uh, to this moment in, in your film. Um, and I know, uh, Nancy, your film was, I believe it was shot on sets outside of New York, yeah. um, but the, your cast is, is all Wilmington, New York Wilmington, North Carolina. <laughs> because we, it was, um, so we shot this in 1993, takes place in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, so had, had a run all that, all, all that time span um, with production design, changing the blocks, New York City blocks. There was no way we could afford to shut down all those stores for all that time and dress it and bring cars from every era. So we did it in back lots, but yeah. So, and we had to import like things like Italian bread, 
Like, we couldn't get the local bakers to make the bread the way, and I'm doing close-ups of it, so it's like, we had to like import, you know, so, and, and import people, import extras, which yeah. we imported a, a big chunk of our Bronx Italian neighborhood. And, and your cast is very local, I think. It's uh, just in the spirit of full disclosure, I have a very brief appearance <laughs> as a come clean, <laughs> as a background performer in Joanna's film. And I, uh, I also live in Brooklyn. I live very close to the bar in which you shot that scene. And um, so that seems sort of integral to the fabric of the film, the, the sort of, uh, the fact that your cast was comprised of, in part, people who, live and work in the world that where the film takes place. Yeah, um, it was important to me to cast some first time actors in addition to the experienced ones. Um, and I, I, you know, adding to the different textures like you were saying and um, uh, yeah, and also just the locations, like it was a very small budget film and I ended up I begged for most of these uh, from everyone I knew, and a lot of these were kindly, very kindly donated by f friends. Or friends is of everyone friends. running away from you now when they Pretty see? Pretty much, <laughs> I am. I am out of favors. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I just feel like there's like a certain like you know, this there's a scene with my friends shot in their house, so you know things like that. And just one other sort of casting related question. I'm, uh, I think that there's something so inspired in the selection of, um, in both of your films, um, these, these um, male actors who play characters who are sort of foils, both sexual, social, and in various different contexts with this sort of protagonist. Um, and bet whether it's uh, Vincent D'Onofrio, Michael Imperioli, who plays uh, Lily Taylor's quasi-romantic opposite, although it's complicated. Um, and then Scott Cohen, uh, who plays uh, one of Anne's uh, romantic or sexual partners. Uh, Babak Tafti, who's another. Uh, th I think they are so, their performances are all so beautifully calibrated to uh, the performances of the, the women protagonists. And I wonder how you went about um, selecting those actors for those roles and sort of crafting the roles in a way that illuminates something about the protagonist's experience. If you can speak to that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I mean, I think with casting Scott, I was mainly looking for someone who uh, would be and like add complexity to the role because like I didn't want it to you know like I was saying I I, I wanted this to be a well-rounded portrait of a BDSM casual relationship and people to not you know come down hard on him, um, so I yeah I felt like he had this interesting presence and comic timing that I thought would work well, and um, with Bobak. I had zoomed with him once about a different role, actually, and I, he just seemed like the perfect Chris character, and, and those scenes have a lot of dialogue, so I was looking for someone who could have like a lot of thought in their dialogue, and um, that's how I came to those two. Um, I, and, I, and I think it, it's fun, in both movies, I think what, what these guys brought to their roles was really um, equal participation because you know sometimes when you center a, a woman role, suddenly uh, sometimes in some movies like the guy can become the girlfriend role, you know, and you don't and you don't want that because that's not where if you're interested in portraying like real full human experiences, you want everyone to be the center of their universe. Um, <clears throat> so um, Vince, actually, I was a little worried because uh, we were we, so we were looking for the role of Joseph, and Lily suggested Vince. But he had played her boyfriend in Mystic Pizza, <laughs> and then he was going to play her father. And I was like, "How oh, man, how is that going to work? Um, I, can I handle that?" You know, like. Um, and but look, he he did an incredible. He he's an incredible actor, um, and he did this lifespan of being like from going from this young guy to this older guy who has this grown daughter who's like, he thinks is like losing her mind, um, uh, and I think he was very much. 
he just took, again, just took it in deeply as, you know, head of the household. He, he went all for it, and he, he, I know that he used um, probably a lot of people in his family, the old guard, as that, because this, this is a movie that takes place before our time. So use that, those rules that were so important to those guys. And, um, and, then, and then Michael Imperioli was like, he, I, I, don't, I don't know what to say. He, he just, another one, the two of them just embodied, they just went in and, and embodied these characters. And he was like this, am, the ambitious young college guy who's gonna you know, be a lawyer and he has it all figured out how much money he's gonna make and you know, what private clubs he'll belong to. And, and, you know, and then he's talking to Lily and Lily's like on another planet. You know? <laughs> I want to open it. That was an impressive five-year plan he outlined. <laughs> <laughs> the Villanova, the Villanova plan, yes. Very specific. Yeah. I want to open it up to the audience in case there are any questions. I, I know that um, many of you may not have seen one or both films, um, but uh, please ask away. I have more to ask as well if, uh, if needed, but I see a hand up here already. Uh. Um. I have a question for both of you, uh, but it goes back to something that Nancy was saying earlier in the conversation um, about not playing to the gaze, not playing to the joke. And um, I'm curious if you can both talk about, um, it seems to me that one of the, the main elements of accomplishing not playing to those things has to do with pacing, which was really evident in both of those clips that we saw. So I'm curious if you can talk about how you're thinking about accomplishing not playing to those things and being, I can't remember the, the words that Nancy used, but, um, but sort of uh, having it be a fuller, truer uh, portrayal, um, how you accomplish that in terms of pacing both for the actors and for the camera. Thank you. Uh, sure. Um, well, I guess for comedy, I really like to let things play out in the wide when possible and have uh, long takes. I feel like that's part of maybe not, I mean, I am trying to get, you know, laughs when I can. Um, so I guess in that sense, I'm playing to the joke, but I, f I find that it's funnier when you're not like trying and, and uh, not like forcing the audience into it and um, letting people experience the context and like sort of the absurdity of the interactions that we find ourselves in. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think it's you know it's not that we don't know that there's a that there's a, a joke there or something that's going to be funny. I think it's almost like like you you travel like like on two tracks all the time. For me, it's like there's a part of me that I know back back in my mind there's an audience in the future that's going to see this. So I want to make sure I get all that stuff and I'm aware of what that is and what the payoffs are going to be for the audience. But there's another part of me that's just crawling in there, and and just really getting inside. And one of my favorite things about directing is if I have four people around a table, or it gets worse when it's like 10 people around a table, that I become each person. And, and, and I think that's where avoiding the gaze and avoiding all that stuff, that's too much from the outside, you know? And then, but if you're inside and you're inside Anne and you're inside her lover, like even as you're, you know, inside the opposite of the person that the movie's about, like, as a director, like you get onto their point of view because when they're going to say their stuff, you, it's them saying it, not you know, the writer or the, the point of view saying it. So it's just crawling around and becoming all these people. Hi. Um, as I said, I haven't seen your film yet, so if it's obvious, I apologize. Um, but you know, when I conceptualize a spiritual relationship between a human and God, Jesus, you know, um, and I consider the intimacy that exists there. I think about how the only relationship that we can begin to sort of replicate that intimacy is, is marriage. Um, and so I guess my question is, is, did you contemplate that during this film? And did you draw that parallel? Yes, maybe not, like I said, in those ways where it's in the dialogue or it's, well, it might be in the dialogue now that I think of it. She kept this notebook. Um, yes, no, she's definitely um, giving herself over to someone. 
and, and to, to Jesus who then gets personified in the story. Yes, yes, absolutely. I really like your definition about independent movies, but my question is how do you see the independent movie industry moving forward, and how do you see the AI impacting the movie industry? The, in the independent industry moving forward, I'm going to give that to Joanna because... <laughs> <laughs> I, maybe you know more than I do, because I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I must confess, making this film the past few years has taken most of my time and attention, and I'm not sure I can So you're speak stepping to... out into the industry now. Yeah, yeah, maybe I can yeah. speak better to that. I'm call you in about a year and see how you're doing. <laughs> maybe you could give me some insight onto how, what it is that's going on. It's changing. It's absolutely uh, changing. And I, I'm, I'd be happy to have other people say, because... Um, I think it's it's really, for me, it's really become this um, like this very uh, not part of all these other things. It's almost standing apart now more. It feels to me like when I started, we were like a a part of a lot of like this bigger you know medium thing, and now I think it's. But but I don't know. I'd really love to hear from other people about it. This actually, I. Um Reminds me of another fascinating similarity between your films. It's sort of a uh, uh, incidental, but but not from a sort of industry standpoint. Um, both Household Saints and The Feeling were executive produced by uh, at least one established filmmaker who you know had maybe come up slightly prior uh, to each of you, uh, Jonathan Demi in, in your case, Nancy, and Sean Baker in your case, Joanna. And so maybe that speaks to um, a constant in, in independent filmmaking, uh, that, that you always sort of need, uh, uh, need to seek out the support of someone who's done it before. Oh, and yes. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was. You said earlier how you want to show honest people in your works, not trying to like make jokes or comedies. Like, how do you make room for improvisation or find a collaborative process with your actors and finding the humor in your films? Yeah, um, my films aren't improvised uh, generally. Um, I I think that with I think there's it's a very collaborative process though because you know I feel like just by being a director and seeing what the actor is bringing to the table and leaving space for that and trying different things together I don't know I just feel like it's always a experiment and a discovery together so I think that improv or no and not all actors I will say like to do improv because I feel like like having like a fixed text, which is like, you know, I mean, can be changed, of course, if the word doesn't feel right, if something feels unnatural. But I don't know, as an actor myself, I know that if it's improv, I'm like, oh, like, I'm gonna, that's annoying. Like, I have to do that too? Like, come on. <laughs> well, it's, it's right, it turns you to a writer, you know, which as an actor, you're, you're in feeling mode. And you, you don't, as a writer, then you go up to your brain and then you have to start thinking like, is that a good line? You know, so I think, Imp improvisation is really funny because it really depends on the movie. Like Household Saints was not improvised either, but my first film had a lot of improvisation in it because everybody was kind of coming from that world and they were bringing their stories and kind of throwing in. And the story that I had kind of accepted that. Like every movie has a personality, and you have to sort of figure out what that personality is. And some are improvisational friendly, and some are like it's already done, it's there. Let's figure out how to get in here. Oh, unfortunately, I think that's just about all the time we have. Uh, so please join me in thanking Nancy and Joanna, and, and thank you all so much.